Hello. So, in this video, we are going to focus on conic sections. Um, so, these are different shapes that are based off cones, which is hence the, the term. So, we're going to be thinking about um, the shapes formed from cones. And they've got lots of interesting geometric properties, and they've got lots of applications. In particular, we're going to look at how parabolas are useful in physics. Um, and we'll need a bit of build up for us to actually prove that. So, in terms of what actually is a conic section, sometimes just called conics, it's when we take a cone and we intersect it with a plane. So, if I had a plane like this, um, which is coming out towards you, intersect a cone, I get a circle. If I tilt it a little bit at an angle, I get an ellipse. If I tilt it even more, I get a parabola. And if it's perfectly at 90 degrees, then I get a hyperbola. So, these are all examples of conic sections. They're useful for various different reasons, as we'll see, but we'll focus on uh, the geometry of them. But it's just important to just think about that they come from cones, hence the name. They've all got their own equations. Um, so, equation of a circle, um, you should know from L of maths. They've also got equation of ellipse, equation of parabola, equation of hyperbola. Um, they've all got these different forms. You can say the general form is this at the bottom, but we're not really going to be worried about that. Um, neither are really these uh, generic forms, but in particular the properties of, properties of them are very useful. So, just to illustrate what I mean, so as you see we've got a plane there that's intersecting the cone, that little black thing is a circle, that would be a conic. If I rotate it a little bit, I'm going to get an ellipse. Okay, keep going, it's still going to get an ellipse. And then eventually, depending on the angle of each one, when it's parallel to the uh, edge of the cone, I'm going to get a parabola. We'll get a hyperbola when we're getting up to 90 degrees. And then it'll start to go back to an ellipse. And then back to the ground. In particular, we've got the law of reflection. Now, all this states is that if we've got uh, a, any sort of ray, that is a uh, wave, that's uh, travelling towards an object, um, so it's hitting this object, it could be some sort of mirror, then it is going to be reflected. That's what we call the angle of reflection. So we've got the angle of incidence is the angle that it arrives at, and the angle of reflection is the angle that it leaves at, and these two angles are equal. That is the law of reflection. Now, how these angles formed, this is quite important, is they're formed through having a normal line, which is going to be at 90 degrees to the actual surface that they make contact with. And we always form the angle from the normal onto the line, from the normal onto the line not from the surface or anything, it's always the angle between the normal and the ray. Um, and those two angles be equal, that's the law of reflection. The reason why we use normal lines is because if we've got any curved surfaces, like we're going to have with conics, then um, it makes it a bit harder to define an angle. I mean, it's a bit easier when you've got a straight line surface here, but when you've got a curve, it's very difficult to actually make sense to have a line that goes with it. So if you say the well, tangent, and then do the normal so that gives that clearly defines an angle that makes it easier for people to actually measure and also for us to calculate so um we're going to look uh, we're going to build up to this idea that parabolas which are the same shape as like, satellite dishes uh, have this property that they are reflective all to a particular point which is called the focus of the parabola okay so if we take any ray that is parallel to uh, the y-axis, okay, then that is always going to reflect at an angle that's going to take it to the focus. Now, if we go back briefly to what I just said a moment ago, let's think about how we could mathematically prove that. So, I said the angle of reflection was made, and the angle of incidence were made, by taking tangent, by taking normal to the curves. First of all, we need a tangent. And then we would need a normal to the curve. The angle between the um, ray and the normal line is going to be the angle of incidence. And the angle, uh, so that ray would carry on, sorry. The angle between them is going to be the angle of reflection. Um, so we're going to manage to show that the, uh, the angle that it's going to reflect at would take it exactly to the focus point that we've got.
Okay, so that's going to require a bit about normal lines, tangents, um, working out an angle somehow, or maybe some working out a different way of showing that the same. But in general, it's going to require you to know about a few of the properties of a parabola. In summary, everything can be pretty much uh, illustrated in this diagram here. Um, apart from the fact that it is drawing the angle using a tangent, but of course that is fine because the normal line is just going to be 90 degrees away from that. So, so if the correct angles are equal on the tangent, then the same angle, correct angles be equal for the normal line. So you don't want to think about what we need to show um, and how we can show it. In particular, what we're aiming for is that angle 3 is equal to angle 1. But in order to do that, we need to know about the equation of the parabola. We need to know... Uh, about how we're going to calculate the tangents, the normal lines, and see how we're going to show that these are in fact equal. The first thing that we need to do in terms of tangent, uh, in terms of parabolas, is to clearly define what we need to know about them. So, um, I'm going to draw an axis. So a parabola is anything. So it's not like a quadratic. We're going to draw one going in this direction. So it's quadratic on its side. Okay. And um, we're going to think about the properties that this would have. So, first thing that we've got is we've got a focus point, which is often called S, probably due to some uh, naming convention or some, probably what it is in a different language. Okay, we've also got the uh, particular line. So, if we take the, this is, this is the y axis, then the point that's got the minus coordinate of that. So I could say that this is a, and I'm going to say it's zero because it's at the middle of the problem. Okay, so let me just draw, show my x-axis. Okay, and just actually make things a little bit easier. Let's have my y-axis being right there. So if we take uh, the coordinate where we've got minus a and draw a line. Going down, this is what we call the directrix. So the directrix of the parabola is the line of that equation. So it'll be equation x is equal to minus a. And we've got this really important uh, property of a parabola, which is that if we take any point that is on the curve, which I could call x, y, then the distance between that and the focus point is always the same as the distance between that point and the equivalent uh, y value on the directrix. Okay, so this distance here we're going to call d1, this distance here we're going to call d2. These are equal. This is the key point of a parabola. As you can see, I'm not drawing it very well because those distances quite clearly visually aren't equal. Um, but the definition of a parabola is that these two distances are equal for any value of x and y on the curve. So all the values on the curve are uh, the points where the distance between those points and the focus is equal to the distance between the point and the directrix. So let's uh, go around and see what we can do with that. So if I were to think about what the distance d1 is, well... Um, let me get some colour so it's just not all in purple. So distance from here to here, well that's just the x coordinate of the parabola. And then we've got the distance from here to here. Well the distance is just a. Okay, the value might be minus a, but the actual distance is just a. So that d1 is just simply going to be a plus x. Okay, um, we don't need any distance formula, we don't need anything squared there because uh, the y values are the exact same. So this is the point where x is minus a and we've got y. Now, let's see how we can calculate d2. Now, this is a point where they're not in the same straight line, so we are going to need to do a square root. So... What things need to go inside that square root? Well, changing x coordinates. So we've got from x to a. So I'm going to do x minus a. That's my change in x. That's my squared. 
and then my change in y is going to be y squared. Now, as I say, the definition of a parabola is that these two distances are equal, i.e. that d1 is equal to d2. That's the definition. So, what does this lead us? Well, d1 is a plus x, d2 is equal to that distance that we've got there, x minus a squared plus y squared. Let's now square both sides, so I've got a plus x all squared is equal to x minus a all squared plus y squared. Okay, now let's expand those brackets using our binomial theorem. So I've got a squared plus 2ax plus x squared is equal to x squared minus 2ax plus a squared plus y squared. You're fine, we can start to cancel some things. So I could cancel out the x squared, so I could cancel out the a squared, I can add 2ax to both sides, so I get that 4ax is equal to y squared. This is our generic equation for a parabola tilted this way. You could do a similar thing for an, um, going a rotated one, and you'd get basically x squared is 4 a y and be that way around. So just um, essentially swapping coordinates to uh, get the correct shape. So that is our general equation of a parabola. Right, so I now would like to talk about the parametric form of a parabola. Now, parametrics are a useful way of describing curves um, by given a free, just a particular variable, a parameter t, and then given x and y as a function of that coordinate. Um, so we need to think about what an appropriate, um, probably better if I draw, so that's what an appropriate uh, parameterization would be. So this is supposed to go through the origin. Uh, that's probably better if I, something like that. Yeah, bit of a tip, try and draw the curve before you draw the axes on them. So, uh, so we've got our parametric, well, uh, sorry, we've got our conic section, which is our parabola, which we just showed had the equation y squared is equal to 4ax. And we've got a certain way of parameterizing it, that a very common way that's most useful to us, and we're going to be able to use to help us find gradients. So, a few things that we need to note about this curve. The x value is positive. Okay, so that means our whatever our parameterization for x is going to have to give us positive values. It can't give us negative values, so that won't be on the curve. And secondly, the y values are positive and negative, so we need some sort of parameterization that works for both. And they need to satisfy this relationship. Y squared has to equal 4ax. So, common way of doing it. So if we want a positive thing, we could normally think about something squared. I think about t squared that would give us all the positive values and if I, could, I could just set y is equal to t and that would give us both positive and negative values if we let t be positive and negative uh, however this wouldn't satisfy our equation here if I add y squared that would be t squared and if I had 4ax that's going to be 4at squared. So that doesn't quite work. So I need to do something to sort this out basically. So the y value, I c problem that we're getting with it is we're not getting a and we're not getting the 4. So we can get the 4 by squaring 2. I can get the a by a, but then that's going to give me a squared. So perhaps we can put an a on the x, and that will give us a t squared. Now, does that work? Okay, so if I have y squared, that's 2a t squared, okay, which is equal to 4a squared t squared, and that is equal to 4a uh, times a t squared 
that is equal to 4ax. Okay, so that is a possible parameterization. It's not the only one. However, it is by far the most useful one. So this parameterization is a useful one to remember, and it's going to uh, be another way of working with our parametric curve. So now that we've got our parametric form of our parabola, we can now start to try and think about tangents and normal lines, which we're going to need to if we're aiming to prove this idea that parabolas reflect following the law of reflection. So we need to be able to calculate the gradient of a tangent line at a point, probably better if they are a different colour, and also the normal line. So we're going to need points on the curve, which should be fair enough with our formulas, but we're also going to need gradients. So there's a two different ways that we can do this, and I'll show you both of them. So one way is to start with the equation that we've got defining it and do implicit differentiation. So if we've got y squared is equal to 4ax, differentiating both sides with respect to x. So I can say that I'm differentiating uh, both sides, I'm differentiating the whole equation in some sense. And we're going to have that 2y dy by dx. That's the implicit differentiation. You differentiate as if with respect to y, a times by dy dx. Differentiate this, I'm going to get 4a. And so if I rearrange it, so I'm going to have dy dx is equal to 4a divided by 2y, or just 2a divided by y. Um, if you wanted it explicitly in terms of x, you could substitute what y would be. So obviously it would be the square root of 4ax, so you could say it would be 2 root ax. That's another way of writing it, assuming of course that um, we've got, um, well, taking the positive square roots in terms of the y coordinate, but if it were the lower y coordinate, so I'll think about the shape, taking the positive one, so we're going up, taking the negative y coordinate, we have a negative gradient. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Another way is to look at our parameterization that we just came up with. x is a t squared, y is 2at, and use parametric differentiation, which is a trick with a chain rule. So if I differentiated this with respect to t, I've got dx by dt, that would give me 2at. Differentiate with respect to t, so I'm going to differentiate with respect to t, that's going to give me 2a. And if I want to calculate dy by dx, well, dy by dx is the same as dy by t, dt divided by dx by dt. So that is 2a over 2at. Be careful not to say all that one in too quickly. And the 2a's cancel, and I get 1 over t being left over. And if I rearrange this top one for t, I'd get t is y over 2a or 1 over t is 2a over y. So you can see that these are both equivalent ways. Okay, so if you know the parameter, you can do 1 over t. If you just know um, what the um, focus is and what the um, y value is, you can use uh, 2a over y. So both ways of calculating uh, gradients and tangents. If I wanted a gradient of a normal line, of course, it would be the negative reciprocal. So uh, this is showing me my tangent. If I wanted my normal gradient, I could say that is minus y over 2a, or a bit more bad, I'd probably say minus 2 root ax over 2a. And those twos, I've got to cancel my graph, so I could get like that. Um, so that is a, another way of writing it. Right, so now that we've established um, our gradient of a tangent to a parabola, let's just uh, try and write down what our general equations would be for tangents and normal lines. So firstly, the fact that the gradient of the tangent is 1 over t would mean that the gradient of the normal line would be the negative reciprocal. Okay, so that would be minus t. Now, remember our parameterization, we had that x is equal to at squared, y is equal to 2at. So if we could talk about any uh, 
coordinates here. So using our equation of a line, i.e. Y, y minus Y1 is M lots of X minus X1. I could simply have um, Y minus 2AT for a particular value of T. Our gradient was 1 over T. And I've got X minus AT squared. So a bit of algebra, so let's say it times out. So I've got Ty take 2AT is equal to X minus AT squared. So um, that should have a T squared there, sorry, so times up by T. So Ty add 2AT squared to both sides and get Ty is equal to X plus AT squared. And that is our general uh, equation for a tangent. Notice that we need the value of uh, T. Or we could have the x and y. Um, you could write it all in terms of x and y, using the fact that, um, well, because x is at squared, that's just going to be x1. So we could have left it sort of in this form, which not necessarily is useful. Um, but also, given the fact that t based off this is equal to uh, y over 2a. So we're specifying points here. So particular values of t. That gives us our gradient. Uh, you don't need to remember this equation, but this is just an example, and it will actually be useful uh, to refer to when we're trying to prove the um, reflective property of parabolas. And similarly, for a normal line, I could do a very similar thing. So I'd get to this step y minus 2at is equal to minus t x minus at squared. So y minus 2at is equal to minus tx plus a t cubed and we tend to write it so we've got a lot of positives so y plus tx is 2 a t plus a t cubed that would be the equation of normal line um, just to note even though we've got cubes in there there's a linear relationship between y and x so it's still going to give us a straight line it's not going to give us a cubic it's not a cubic because t is a parameter it's not the actual variable that we're plotting against Right, so uh, let's aim to derive the reflective property of a parabola. So, um, so uh, from our physics law of reflection, uh, sorry, is that the angle of incidence will equal the angle of reflection. So that is what we're going to aim to prove in this. So we're going to draw our parabola. Um, it's going to be a very messy diagram for going towards the end. Let's try and explain this. So I've got my y-axis here. I'm going to say my x-axis. Um, I'm going to draw a bit lower just so I can make the picture a bit clearer. Obviously, it would be symmetric. So this would be the um, this here would be the y-axis. So we'd have our vertex on the y-axis. So I have something like that, and it would carry on. It'd be so of course it'd be symmetric going this way but I'm not gonna I'm just gonna focus on this top part so we can label everything and hopefully see the picture that we've got in a bit more detail. <coughs> so we need a few things for our problem. So first of all remember that our equation is y squared is equal to four AX. Um, we've got our focus point S which is at the coordinate when X is equal to A and Y is equal to zero. <clears throat> and we've got our directrix here, which is going to be at the core. Well, it's going to have the equation x is equal to minus a. So that's the equation of that line. <clears throat> and so now we need to um, work out what we're actually trying to prove. So uh, we're going to have one key assumption of this claim. So the claim is that if the ray. Okay, is parallel to the x-axis. Okay, then the law of reflection will hold. So I'm just going to write it then. Theta i, angle of incidence, is going to equal theta r, angle of reflection. And I'll define those in the diagram shortly. So we're going to have a, a ray. Um, that's going to 
you're coming in so imagine our probably like a satellite and we're going to have a, a ray of light well, it should be a straight line because light travels in straight lines quite a bit of a better one I'll vaguely do um, so I'm going to do that straight line and it's going to be parallel to the x-axis so I'm going to draw this arrow in like in normal geometry just show it parallel because that assumption that it's parallel is important so um, we need to now remember how physicists define the angle of incidence so the angle of incidence is going to be the angle formed when it makes contact with the surface it's formed from the normal line okay so I can draw a tangent at that point uh, and then I can draw a normal which is going to be 90 degrees to the curve okay so we've got our tangent here and we've got our normal line here now the angle of incidence is defined going from the normal onto the ray so this will be our beta pi okay so the ray is going to then be reflected and it's going to, in particular it's going to be reflected to the focal point s okay so it's all going to reflect to that point now the other angle that we're going to get is going to be the angle of reflection that's formed from the normal onto the ray again I'll just be about exactly this so this angle here is my angle of reflection so my claim is that these two angles are equal so in order to prove this we're going to have to think about the well what angles we've got uh, we might need a few points on there so let's see um, we can label on some points onto our diagram so the equation of our normal was that y plus tx was equal to 2at plus 8t cubed the equation of our tangent was ty is equal to x plus 8t squared okay i'm going to call this point here this is a point on the curve, so I can use the parameterization of the curve to define the point. So I'll call this point P, and the x coordinate is going to be 80 squared, and the y coordinate is going to be 2AD. Okay. So we can try and find some other points now. So going back to our equation for our normal and our tangent now I could find this point so this is when x is equal to 0 so I would have um, sorry it's not when x equals 0 that's absolute nonsense it's when y equals 0 so if y were equal to equal 0 I would have tx is 2at plus 8t cubed divided by t I'd have x is 2a plus 8t squared so this is the coordinate for 2a plus 8t squared, 0. We could also think about um, this point here on the tangent. We could also think about where it touches the, the y-axis. Um, we're also going to think about where it touches the x-axis. So I'm going to draw a very, potentially not draw a straight line, but let's look at the value when it equals 0 here. So when x is equal to 0, I would have ty is 80 squared, so that means y is going to equal 80. Okay, so that's the tangent when it equals 0. So I've just drawn, not drawn the picture well enough. And we've got our focal point. So we now need to think about what we what earth we can do to show that beta i is equal to beta r. Now first thing that I just want to point out is our parallel lines here so we've got the ray I'll just carry on it's going to be parallel to the x-axis 
So if we've got a line that's going to go between them, we're going to have corresponding angles or alternate angles and so on. Now, what I want you to look at these two red lines, this is a normal and a tangent. Now we know that normals and tangents meet at right angles at 90 degrees. So I know that this is going to be 90 minus theta i. I've defined theta i as the angle from a normal. It's going to be 90 minus that because tangents and normals are perpendicular. Now, if we were to look at our normal, this would be a transversal. This would be a bridging line going between the two parallel lines. So this would be a corresponding angle here, which will also be 90 minus theta i. Okay. Uh, a very similar point as well is if we look at this, uh, our normal line, this here we've got alternate angles of theta i, so this angle is theta i. Okay, we have no idea what this angle is. So, what we can now do is I want to, we can focus, we've got a bit of a triangle with a blue, red, and the of yellow highlighted line, uh, which I now uh, highlight in a different colour. Um, so you see why a decent picture is important. So we've got this triangle here, where we've got theta i and theta r on. Now. For theta i and theta r to be equal, if they were equal, this would give us an isosceles triangle. So all we need to do is show that this triangle is isosceles, which means all we need to show is that this length is equal to this length. I'm just going to put a question mark so we don't actually, I'm not showing that yet. But if we could show that, then we're done. We've proved that theta i is equal to theta r because we've got made the isosceles triangle. So, how could we do that? Well, we could figure out distances. So, what is this length and what is that length going to be? Um, so, I've drawn the this length not very well because they're not at the same x coordinate. One's a t squared, one's a. Okay. Now, however, this across is both from y equals 0, so the distance is just the difference in those two coordinates. So that distance there is just going to be 2a plus at squared, take away a, so that's just a plus at squared. That's that distance. Now let's look at trying to prove this distance between p and s. So this is where we're going to need our distance formula. Uh, just to avoid the square root, I'm just going to write it, well, we don't really need the square root, so we can get it to be the same looking thing like this. Um, so, it's going to be the square root, and then we need to do difference in x coordinate squared plus difference in y coordinate squared. So, the x coordinates, if I do p minus s that way, I've got at squared minus a squared. Difference in the y coordinates is just 2 a t all squared. Okay, now we need to expand this little bracket, so use the binomial theorem, so we'll have a squared t to the 4 minus 2 lots of so many times them together, so that's going to be a squared t squared plus a squared, and then squaring this term, we've got 4 a squared t squared. So I've got that PS is equal to, so which terms have we got? These two terms are the same, so I've got A squared T to the 4 plus 2A squared T squared plus A squared. That looks like another square bracket, doesn't it? Because of the coefficients, we've got 1, 2, 1. So let's see what we can write it as. So it looks like it's going to be something squared, which will be useful given the square root that we've got. So uh, I've got an a term and I've got an a squared t to the 4 term. So if I square root of the a term, I'd get a. 
if I square it this term, I would get a t squared. Does it work? Sine of zero, get those plus, so that'll work. So, choose that those numbers make a positive value. We can take the square roots of a t squared plus a, which is the exact same as this here. So therefore we have proved we have an isosceles triangle. I'm going to call this, I'm going to call this point x for the sake of it. So I've got PSX is isosceles. Therefore, theta i is equal to theta r. So under the assumption that the ray is parallel to the x-axis, we have managed to show that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And that's what all the stuff that you learn in the further maths unit about parabolas is building up to. So you look at the directrix, learn all these different bits, building up to this proof. Proof that the law of reflection holds for parabolas. Okay, so we've now proved that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection under the assumption that the original ray that's hitting our parabola is parallel to the x-axis. Um, you might think this is a bit of an odd uh, stance because we've given a particular blue ray, but if you look at the argument that we've made, not a single thing refers to exactly where that blue ray is. So we've proved this for every single blue ray that's parallel to the x-axis, not just the particular that we've drawn, I've not used anything special about the ones that I've drawn, I've just used general points on uh, general facts that we know about parabolas, tangents, normals, and so on. So this does actually prove it in its full generality, which feels a bit weird because we've used the very specific picture to help us get there. One thing that we have not yet proved, however, is that the reflected ray then goes through the focal point, the focus of the parabola. So in the next video, I will show you a proof of how that works.